Hi, I'm Juliana Lennington from Back to Space, and today I will be interviewing the head of NASA, Jim Bridenson. Welcome. Thank you, Juliana. Okay, so just to start, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at NASA? Yeah, so I am the NASA Administrator. That's my title. A lot of people don't know what that means, but I'm, I'm the, the head of NASA, if you will. And of course, uh, we, ha we have a number of different mission directorates within NASA, but of course, people are familiar with human exploration. We have a big agenda now to go to the moon. We also have what we call the Science Mission Directorate, where we send robots to different parts of our solar system, and now even beyond. Uh, and then we have an aeronautics mission directorate that is focused, of course, on making sure that the United States of America has preeminent technology for aviation because then we can keep our exports strong as a country. Uh, and then, of course, we have what we call a space technology mission directorate that helps us develop space. So all of these things conspire to create a, a budget that's about $21 billion annually. Um, and the president and the vice president have been increasing that on our behalf because they want to see us do some spectacular things and have the United States of America lead again in space, which is what we're working on right now very strongly. And it's, it's a great time to be the head of NASA. Yeah, it's great. So you were born right after the Apollo program was finishing up. Um, did you feel like you were brought up in a place that space exploration was appreciated and celebrated? I, I think so. And you know, I was born in 1975. The last time we had people on the moon was 1972. So I, I'm, the, I'm in fact, I'm the first NASA administrator that wasn't alive when we actually walked on the moon. And what I'm trying to do now is make sure that there's never again another generation that is not alive when we have people on the moon. That's important. Uh, we want to go sustainably to the moon. The president put in Space Policy Directive 1 to go to the moon sustainably, in other words, to stay. Um, and that's part of, of what we're trying to achieve. But I do remember growing up and watching, in fact, the very first space shuttle launch um, and just looking on in wonder. Um, I, I think space has this thing of tr you know, transcending generations and inspiring um, even years after the accomplishment is achieved. It's a part of who we are as America, and it's a part of American preeminence, and, uh, and I, think it's, I think it's important that we continue that. So as a kid, was your dream job a pilot, astronaut? Yeah, it was never really to be an astronaut. Um, I was always interested in being a pilot. Uh, when I was in first grade, they asked us to draw a picture of what we wanted to be when we grew up, and I drew a picture of an airplane. And I had a guy standing next to the airplane in a hat. And I thought, I guess I, my, my view in first grade was that if you had a hat, you were a pilot, I guess. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> but I wrote on there, I wrote, I want to be a pilot. And I spelled it P-I-E-L-E-O-T in first grade. <laughs> so obviously, I didn't know how to spell. But then, of course, as time went on, that interest continued to grow. Um, a number of events happened in my life that solidified that. And when I graduated from college, I joined the Navy to, uh, to be a pilot. Wow. Uh, could you talk about some of the science that you're doing on the ISS that might be like, combining the two? A absolutely. So right now, on the, the, the International Space Station has a bunch of amazing science happening inside the vehicle. So we talk about the, the big things are industrialized biomedicine. Um, the idea that we can compound pharmaceuticals in space in a way you can't do on the gra in the gravity well of Earth. We talk about um, the idea that you can print in three dimensions human organs using adult wow. stem cells. You can print that in space in a way you cannot do in a gravity well. If you do it here on Earth, the tissue just flattens out because of the gravity. But if you do it in space, you can actually create three-dimensional tissue that will benefit humanity here on Earth. Um, we're proving that the, the retina of an eyeball, you can use materials in space to create retinal implants that will make sure that people in the future who have certain types of macular degeneration who go blind, they will be able to continue to see. Yeah. Those materials you cannot create in the gravity well of Earth, but they'll be transformational if we can manufacture them in space. So all of these things conspire um, to say that there's coming a day when there's going to be a very robust commercial marketplace in low Earth orbit for human activity. And it's industrialized biomedicine, it's material sciences, and, and all of that is very promising. But the International Space Station is also, it, think of it as it, it, it's, it's a satellite that you can attach things to mm -hmm. on the outside. So we attach all kinds of payloads to the International Space Station to test them out and see 
will this work if we're trying to figure out you know, how the atmosphere is changing? Um, we, we can put experiments on the International Space Station to get measurements as to how the atmosphere is changing. And then if, if those measurements are uh, validated, then we can actually create free flyers um, and not, not waste money, yeah. if that makes sense. So, and the other thing that's valuable about the space station is it's tended by humans. Yeah. So if something goes wrong or breaks, you can fix it with a spacewalk. So all of these things are very positive. The International Space Station has, first of all, it's, it's, it's the, 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 the biggest project ever done by humanity outside of war. <laughs> um, and nothing even comes close. It, it is a technological marvel. It's a diplomatic marvel. 15 nations operating the ISS. Astronauts from 18 different nations. Um, and in fact, experiments from 103 different nations on the International Space Station. So it has been a great tool for learning. And in the future, we're going to see a commercialization of human activity in low Earth orbit, where we're going to have dozens of space stations in the future. And it's because of what we've, we've learned on the International Space Station. So the commercial sector is also private as well, SpaceX, Blue Origin. How is NASA, their connection right now, now and in the future? That's a great question. So NASA turns to commercial industry to be a partner. So they go and get investments from, from private investors, and they, sometimes they invest their own money, and NASA invests in money. And they develop capabilities that NASA can use. Um, and for example, commercial crew to the International Space Station. NASA doesn't purchase, own, and op operate the hardware anymore. Um, what NASA does is, is we buy a service from these commercial partners that we have helped foster. Um, and that's going to be true for crew to the International Space Station as well through something we call commercial crew, and eventually commercial habitation, commercial space stations. So all of these things are, um, are very good, but NASA has a keen interest in making sure that we develop these commercial markets, and I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. Because then NASA can be one customer of many customers mm -hmm. in a very robust marketplace in low Earth orbit, and we can have numerous providers that are competing against each other on cost and innovation. And ultimately, the goal is to have lower cost and more access to do more than we've ever done before. And then we can take the resources that are granted to us by the taxpayer and we can go further and do more. We can go to the moon, we can go to Mars. So the commercialization effort is strong. Um, we support our commercial partners. They're in fact necessary for what we're trying to achieve and we work with them all the time. Let's talk about Artemis, I guess. Yes. Um, so the end goal is 2024. Yeah. We're going to yeah. make it? Yes. yes. 100%. Okay. 100%. Yes. So what, what it has to happen? I guess so. you can never say 100%. But yeah. <laughs> every, all the plans we're putting together would lead us to that eventuality. OK. And what has to happen from now to then to make that happen? Um, so a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got to get the SLS rocket built, the largest, most powerful rocket. It's on the five yard line. We're about to punch it into the end zone. So that's there. The Orion crew capsule needs to get complete. We need to build a space station in orbit around the moon. We call it Gateway. Uh, and that's going to enable us to stay at the moon for long, long periods of time. And then we need to have a lander to go back and forth from the Gateway. We're building reusability into the system, which is important. Um, and I like how you said, let's talk about Artemis. Yeah. <laughs> we love the name Artemis. 50 years ago, we went to the moon under a program called Apollo. Apollo was a Greek god. Well, Artemis was his twin sister. 50 years ago, all of the pilots came from the fighter pilot community or the test pilot community, and there were no opportunities for women in those days. Well, today at NASA, we have a very diverse, highly qualified astronaut corps that includes women. And this time, when we go to the moon, we go with all of America. So we have named the program to go back to the moon after the twin sister of Apollo. Mm -hmm. And she happens to be the goddess of the moon. And this time when we go to the moon, we will have young ladies with the mission. And mm -hmm. of course, there's nobody more excited about that than my 11-year-old daughter. Yeah. So it's a, it's a good story. And we look forward to making sure when we go to the moon next time, we go with all of America. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about how we're going back with all of America and the next part of America is my generation and generations to come. What do you have to say to them if they want to go into the STEM field? There, there are so many opportunities. Um, and when we think about what is in front of us, right now we have budgets that are increasing for the first time in a long time, budgets that are increasing significantly for space exploration. We have commercial partners. 
um, that are expanding our ability to do more than we've ever been able to do before. We have international partners. You go back to Apollo, it was the United States of America, and that was it. Now we've got 15 nations partnered on the International Space Station, and there's a lot more nations that are creating space agencies every day to, to grow our ability to do more. We're gonna go to the moon sustainably. We have the miniaturization of electronics, the ability to store power in, in much smaller um, mass than we've ever had before. We have infrastructure that we didn't have in the 1960s already built. So all of these things collude to say, we are at the precipice of doing things that are absolutely magnificent. Mm -hmm. So if there are people out there that are interested in the STEM fields, and by the way, it's not just STEM fields, but interested in space. We, we need space law, we need space policy, and of course, we need, we need people that understand you know, politics as well. Um, but certainly the STEM fields, there is no shortage of opportunity for people in the future. Okay. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. Thank it's you. been a pleasure. So. Absolutely, I, my honor. Very you. nice to know <laughs> you. Nice. And good luck with all of this, thank it's you. great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe to see more great content and keep up with us on all our latest adventures. Click here to watch some of our other videos now.